First of all, for all of Dr. White's students that are here, there are sign-in sheets on the table outside of the hall. So if you put your name on there, make sure that Dr. <coughs> gets your name. And also, if you're not already on our mailing list, on the main Paris City mailing list, if you also put a, an email address on there, we'll make sure that we contact you when we have another program. First of all, um, Again, welcome to tonight's program. Our speaker tonight, Dr. Seth White, is an associate professor of history here at Golden State College. He's a Florida native, and he received his PhD from Florida State University. Here at Golden State, he teaches courses on African American history, the Civil Rights Movement, New South, <coughs> and the history of Georgia. Dr. White is the author, co author, editor, and co editor. Of numerous works, uh, including A Forgotten Front, Florida During the Civil War Era, and Neither an Accusing Nor a Trial Body, Florida State Legislature Attempts to Hall of Immigration. Tonight's program, Dalton's Red Menace, Don West and McCarthy in Northwest Georgia, delves into an area of Northwest Georgia history that has either been overlooked or deliberately covered up. During the 1930s and 1940s, labor movements and labor tensions in Georgia, particularly Northwest Georgia, drew attention from state and federal government. The possible threat of communist subversion was always a major concern. This fear of the Red Menace culminated in the 1950s with the accusations and actions of Wisconsin Senator Joseph McCarthy and his brand of terror called McCarthyism. In Dalton, Don West, an activist and former member of the American Communist Party, was attacked for his political views. This brought part of the Cold War to this region of the state. In the talk tonight, Dr. Weiss will examine McCarthyism in Northwest Georgia during the 1940s and 50s, and how it related to other southern states, and focus on the role of Don West played in the story. Now, when Brian asked me to deliver a talk, uh, I had a bunch of different topics in mind, but then when he said, could it be something related to the area, I said, okay, but does it have to be about the Civil War? Because that's what first comes to mind when I think about history in this area. And while I've done research on the Civil War before, I know that a lot of people have spoken about the Civil War in this part of the state. So I wanted to do something different. And I got to thinking. And in my first semester teaching here back in 2010, I was teaching over in Gilmer County in, in LJ. And one day, a colleague of mine, a former colleague um, who's no longer teaching here, Don Davis, said, can I catch a ride with you and go over to Elegit? And I said, sure, I could use the company. It's a long drive. And I said, what do you, what do you need to do over in Elegit? And he said, well, I want to go look at the records in the county courthouse that they have for a man named Don West. And I had just moved here. I had never heard of Don West before. And he knew that a lot of my research had focused on McCarthyism. And a lot of my doctoral dissertation had focused on McCarthyism in Florida. And he said, well, now that you're here, why don't you start looking at McCarthyism in Georgia, specifically this part of the state? And I said, OK. And I promptly did nothing on it for about seven years. Uh, then when Brian said, let's do something, and why don't you focus it on this part of the state, my mind started going. And I said, oh, well, wait a minute. OK, yeah, uh, connecting the dots. And I uh, started thinking, I started looking, and here we have it, what I came up with. This part of the state, and something that happened in Dalton, in particular, in the 1950s. But I, what I wanted to do was tie in with a lot of the other research 
that I have done in the past on what had happened, McCarthyism in the South, in Florida, see what had happened in Georgia overall, and specifically tie it to what happened with Don West's story, Dalton's story in general. So here we go. The term McCarthyism, the term McCarthyism has entered the American lexicon and it's generally accepted as a term describing the early years in the Cold War that saw Wisconsin Senator Republican Joseph McCarthy vigorously pursue the alleged communist threat to American society. Historian Ellen Schrecker, one of the leading scholars on McCarthyism, argues that the term is merely a generalization. According to Schrecker, most victims of what has come to be called McCarthyism never had any contact with Joe McCarthy. She defines McCarthyism as the most widespread and longest lasting wave of political repression in American history. In order to eliminate the alleged threat of domestic communism, a broad coalition of politicians, bureaucrats, and other anti-communist activists hounded an entire generation of radicals and their associates, destroying lives, careers, and all institutions that offer a left-wing alternative view to mainstream politics and culture. It used all the power of the state to turn dissent into disloyalty, and in the process, drastically narrowed the spectrum of acceptable political debate. As the United States emerged from the Second World War as one of the foremost superpowers in the world, it plunged into its next war, what it deemed an ideological crusade to contain the spread of communism around the globe. By the late 1940s, a bigger threat loomed on the horizon, closer to home. Whether real or contrived, it terrified Americans and allowed cold warriors to use the fear of the red menace infiltrating American society to protect their own values and promote their own causes. On the national level, the demagogue Joseph McCarthy spearheaded witch hunts that ruined countless lives. He garnered fame and attention, but it was at the state and local levels where more damage was done, especially in the South, where the region was undergoing immense social change. There, McCarthyism and anti-communism took on a life of its own often surpassing the terror of the Wisconsin Senator's reign and usually used as a pretext to halt integration and other perceived affronts to the white Southern way of life. Mississippi Governor Ross Barnett said, I am thoroughly convinced that it, meaning the civil rights movement, is a part of the world communist conspiracy to divide and conquer our country from within. Southern states, Georgia included, used communism, or rather the facade of an anti-communist crusade to attack all who opposed their way of life. In 1950s Georgia, that meant the NAACP and others who pushed for integration. Basic rights, civil rights, unions, labor rights, and workers' rights. By linking or attempting to link communism to rights and freedoms, states and local governments, law enforcement agencies, as well as newspapers and ordinary citizens, painted activists as unpatriotic and un-American. In a small corner of northwest Georgia, this battle was being fought in the mid-1950s in the small city of Dalton. 
as cold warriors found an enemy in the emerging labor movement and their fiery spokesman Don West, a longtime labor activist who had joined the Communist Party in the 1930s, but who came under greater scrutiny during the heightened tensions of the Cold War and the Red Scare of the 1950s. In the late 1920s, the Communist Party of the United States began a campaign aimed at swelling its ranks by encouraging interracial cooperation. This was met with fear and virulent attacks, especially in the South, especially in North Georgia, was, which was within the reach of the CPUSA's weekly newspaper. The Southern Worker published just across the state line in Chattanooga. Georgia politicians were aware and fearful of not only the party's weekly news organ, but also of the growing support in industrial cities such as Birmingham, Alabama, which was also not far enough away for their liking. The high point for communism in Georgia came during the early part of the 1930s, during the Great Depression, before Franklin Roosevelt was elected or was able to enact his New Deal policies. By the 1930s, Georgia politics was split into factions, both centering around the Democratic Party. And it was into this political and social climate that Don West's name emerged. Born in 1906 near Ellijay, located 35 miles east of Dalton in the mountains of North Georgia to sharecropping parents. He was an activist from an early age, never conforming to society. He organized a protest in high school against the film The Birth of a Nation, caused him to be expelled from his high school, though he would later graduate. He was also expelled from Lincoln Memorial University in Tennessee for leading another protest against the paternalism of the campus, although he eventually returned to graduate from there in 1929. He went on to study at Vanderbilt University Divinity School in Nashville. He was influenced by the social gospel movement. While a student, he became a socialist. He participated in labor strikes and textile factories and coal mines. He was a poet at heart. Despite his activism, he was a poet at heart. He continued his work as an activist, helping to found the Highlander Folk School in Monteagle, Tennessee, in between Nashville and Chattanooga. This would later become one of the most prominent civil rights training schools during the modern civil rights movement. He stayed there only a year before moving back to Georgia, where he founded his own Southern Folk School and Library in Kennesaw. Back in Georgia, he joined the American Communist Party, became immersed in its causes, including defending African Americans though most of his work lay in the area of labor organization. These positions often brought the wrath of political conservatives in Georgia, and he stayed on the radar of Georgia politicians throughout the 1930s and 1940s. In the 1940s, he moved around the state eventually accepting a teaching position at Oglethorpe University in Atlanta in 1946. For most of the 1930s and 1940s, Georgia was dominated politically by the wild man from Sugar Creek, Governor Eugene Tomich. His anti-labor and anti-government stances put him at odds with the National Democratic Party led by Roosevelt and his New Deal politics, which Talmadge denounced as communist. It also put him at odds with Don West, communists, and those who supported labor. 
usually found in urban areas, such as Atlanta, or rural areas, such as Northwest Georgia. Interestingly, according to public opinion polls taken in the 1930s, most Georgians favored Roosevelt's New Deal policies and more liberal policies in general. But the reality was, many of those that responded to the polls were either African Americans or poor whites, and thus could not vote due to literacy tests and other measures which were still in place from Reconstruction and the dawn of the Jim Crow era. Talmadge's disdain for organized labor was so strong that he considered strikes to be un-American, often calling up the National Guard to help disperse them. On one occasion in 1934, he arrested striking workers and held them without trial in a detention camp, claiming to, quote, personally have broken the backs of the unions in Georgia. The 1948 presidential election proved to be one of the most contentious in American history as the Democratic Party split with the emergence of Strong Thurmond states' rights Democrats or the Dixiecrats in the Deep South. The election was also rife with red baiting as the Progressive Party, under the stewardship of former Vice President Henry Wallace, was often branded as an arm of the Communist Party, taking orders from Moscow. Georgia was home to a local branch of the Progressive Party, but it was hindered by a statement from the state's small Communist Party, which declared that it would help the Progressives in the upcoming election. The reaction from the ruling elite, including the governor, was swift. In May, a professor at the University of Georgia was fired after he was nominated as a state's progressive party candidate for governor. The reason given was that his political activities made it impossible for him to carry out his duties as a professor. The campaign waged against the progressive party was nothing to that conducted by the Atlanta Constitution in hopes of bringing down Don West. West was not a new target by any means, but his vocal support for Henry Wallace brought his name back into the fold. Ralph McGill of the Constitution made it a personal mission to discredit West. McGill, a liberal himself, was worried that West and those like him would sully the liberal name because, in his own words, communists owe their loyalty first to Soviet Russia. West was, in McGill's mind, an enemy of the United States, and thus the newspaper man enlisted the aid of Georgia Congressman James C. Davis to obtain documentation from the House Un-American Activities Committee to help prove West's communist affiliation and subsequent guilt. The findings were enough to expose West and provide Oglethorpe with grounds to dismiss him from his teaching position at the school. The assault on the progressive platform was also successful, as Wallace polled a minuscule 0.39% in Georgia, compared to 2.37% nationally, which is not very impressive, but comparatively speaking, and much lower than Strom Thurmond's 20.3% in the state. Unlike neighboring Alabama and South Carolina, though, Harry Truman easily carried Georgia with over 60% of the state's vote. By the 1950s, a common form of combating the perceived communist threat and often the first line of defense was a loyalty oath. By 1953, 
The height of Joseph McCarthy's power, more than three quarters of states require public employees to sign one as a condition of their employment. The oaths could cover all walks of life, as in Indiana, where boxers had to sign one before stepping in the ring. But Georgia was home to one of the strictest loyalty oaths in the nation. Put in place in 1949 by Eugene Talmadge's son, Governor Herman Talmadge, state employees were required to name any family member who ever belonged to not just the Communist Party, but also any subversive body as defined by the United States Attorney General. Seemingly following orders, one Georgian went as far to list his father, grandfather, and uncle who had served in the Confederate Army. Georgia's loyalty oath remained in place until 1965 when it was removed by the United States Supreme Court. Despite these measures, the early 1950s actually saw Georgia politicians curtail extremist actions and urge restraint in dealing with suspected and alleged communists so as not to foster and create little McCarthy's, as the Atlanta Journal so aptly stated in 1952. Ironically, the climate shifted around the time when McCarthy's power was waning nationally. The change was due not to an increased communist threat. The change was due to the fact that it was common knowledge that the Supreme Court was likely moving against segregation in the ongoing Brown v. Board of Education case. The shift included, but was not limited, to legislative bills as one such as one submitted by Marson J. Dunaway Jr., which called for a mini or Georgia HUAC, and another introduced by Chattooga County's Sloppy Floyd, excellent name, whose goal was to ban all subversive activity while creating a screening program for all state employees. The bill called for the governor to appoint a special attorney to investigate subversion, which Floyd believed would finally result in outlawing the American Communist Party. There was opposition to both proposals within the legislature, mostly because the opposition came from the anti-Talmage faction. Um, they claimed they did not want to see McCarthyist witch hunts within Georgia, but if you actually read the minutes from the legislature, they just didn't like Talmadge, so that's kind of it. And there was also a rivalry between Floyd and Dunway themselves, so they fought one another over it. So that's really where most of the dissent came from. Ultimately, Talmadge supported Floyd. The bill was met with some opposition from citizens throughout the state. Uh, the loudest renouncement coming from the United Church Women of Atlanta, who allied themselves with the Atlanta Journal and other papers, but they didn't call for scrapping the bill. They called for amending the bill. Their fear was that this would turn into a witch hunt and that it wouldn't be used to hunt communists, which is what actually mostly happens. They feared that it would be used as a political weapon, not to actually root out communism. Ultimately, the bill passed. Talmadge signed it into law, creating the Georgia Commission on Education. In early 1954, the group's executive director and Atlanta attorney, Durwood Pye, called for privatization of the state schools, which in itself makes no sense. 
Um, he sought to keep schools segregated by any means possible. He prophesied, communists and their dupes are on the march, and the menacing reds will do anything in their power to destroy laws concerning separate schools for the races. The mere thought of integration terrified Georgia's political leaders. The subsequent election of ardent anti-communist and segregationist Marvin Griffin to the governor's office affirmed this agency's quest to maintain segregation in the schools. In 1957, Griffin would task legislators with broadening the powers of the Education Commission. He wanted the agency to be able to employ investigators, hold hearings, subpoena witnesses. They ended up utilizing any and all propaganda issued by the commission, including the infamous communism in the NAACP pamphlet issued by the commission in 1958 as an attempt to smear the NAACP. It reiterated testimony by noted NAACP authority, Dr. J.B. Matthews, who had testified in front of committees in Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, um, and other erroneous reports that were being distributed to law offices, businesses, churches. After the publication of this report, the state's attorney general published his own published his own report called The Ugly Truth About the NAACP. It was a scathing attack about the NAACP. The state's attorney general, Attorney General Cook, said the NAACP was the most un-American organization in the United States. And he swore that as long as he kept office, the NAACP would be a prime legal target of his. The American Communist Party did have ties to the African American community. The American Communist Party's lawyers had defended the Scottsboro Boys in Alabama in the 1930s. They had organized sharecroppers and tenant farmer unions during the Great Depression. They had helped lead other strikes and protests against unequal employment opportunities. Fearing negative response from white society, in many cases, the NAACP and African Americans in general tried to distance themselves from the communists despite the fact that they were often one of, if not the only white group supporting them at any given time. The NAACP realized the problem, the problem posed by communist support, and they amended their platform to further distance themselves, distance their organization from the communists. At the 41st convention of the NAACP, held in 1949, the organization resolved to form an investigative committee to look into possible infiltration of the group by the communists. The board of directors was further charged with taking necessary action to eradicate such infiltration and, if necessary, suspend and reorganize or lift the charter and expel any unit which comes under communist or other political control and domination. This and other efforts by the NAACP and African Americans did nothing to convince the majority of the white South of their loyalty and the feeble link between the entire African-American community and communism 